<clears throat> Welcome to Fort Knox. I'm John Fort here at the NASDAQ market site. Um, today, we're going to talk about this new era we're getting in streaming media. And I'm here with a special guest, Philip Sonleitner, the co-founder and CEO of Mike Me. Philip, I want to talk to you about your product. I also want to talk to you about stuff that Amazon and Google are doing because we're getting all of these connected camera announcements, which I think are, are really interesting. It's going to be interesting yeah. to see if that goes somewhere that we haven't before. But first, Mike Me. Um, I'm a podcaster, as the Fort Knox audience will know. So this microphone is especially interesting to me. I was skeptical at first. Because the price tag at four ninety nine made me go, ah, I've got something that does good audio for less than that. But this has features that are starting to blow my mind. So explain to me what this is and why you wanted to make it. So basically, it's a studio-grade microphone. But um, I see it's a small black box. But it's uh, as good as a one or two thousand dollar studio microphone. But it's not just a microphone. It also has a built-in audio recorder. So if you hold it and press the top button, it starts recording. So it's working standalone. You don't need a computer or something else. You just talk into it, uh, stop the recording, and then save it internally. So that's nice. Uh, it has a really nice capture. So everyone who's loving audio will realize this is like a full phantom powered capsule. So it has this nice warm analog sound. So hold it up right by, like, almost okay. in front of your face. So that there were so this is a nice capsule. It um, sounds really nice, but the true magic of the thing is how it's connected with the digital domain, basically through the smartphone. Uh -huh. So we have a built-in uh, Bluetooth link where we stream audio data back and forth. So there's Bluetooth 2.1? It's Bluetooth 2.1, but we don't use any like normal Bluetooth profile. So we have a patented um, proprietary link protocol going on, uh -huh. which makes sure that every single piece is missed. So let's say you, you record something for your podcast, and you know now sometimes in Bluetooth some packets are lost. You don't want that because you then would have dropouts. I'm also worrying about what kind of audio file you're giving me. Is this an MP3 oh. file? Is this a oh, WAV oh. file? What is it that you're streaming over Bluetooth? Good question. So in the box itself, we always record uh, raw WAV files in 44.1 kilohertz in 24 bits. It can go up to 96 kilohertz, which is quite good quality. Right. At the same time, we're compressing it to an M4A file, which is sent over Bluetooth. Okay. And the cool thing is there's a free app coming along with it, so we're syncing in real time. It's while you keep recording with your app, so you remotely start it, if you hit press, the audio file is already there. So this is just the audio part. But the really cool thing is we showed it to a lot of people, and they all asked, can you please integrate that with the smartphone camera? Right. And do you have, is this, this the phone where you it's have that phone, video? Yeah. So I can, uh, I can show you. So basically it is um, now... We see the camera of hold the smartphone. It, hold this up. Let me get it. I'll take it. Uh, okay. Actually, you're, you're showing the camera, so hold it up right by your head. Okay. So uh, you see the smartphone camera. If I press record now, so you would hear my voice now from the mic me. So the audio is coming from the mic me, but the video is coming from the camera. And it's matching them together. This is the thing that got me, because we in video, you know, CNBC, we do video all the time, uh, syncing up the audio and the video. So... One isn't a little bit ahead of the others. You see my lips moving, but you notice that my voice isn't coming at the same way. That's something that we're always trying to figure out. We want to avoid things getting out of right, sync. So you did this, and it was in sync. Right. So if you had hit uh, stop now, we're getting all the data. So now it's syncing. It's saving the file, and now it's already there. You take a picture, and now you have the lip sync audio. So you can check out our website that you see how it's working like in, in real case uh, scenarios. But the cool thing is... Uh, the camera on your smartphone and the mic me and the microphone are independent. So you can like, you could talk, but I can move like 15 meters away, like 30, 50 foot, and still we have it in sync. So I can be interviewing somebody with this mic me on a stick, because you yes. got a little threaded, yep. you know, I can put this on a tripod on a stick, you know, with a windscreen, and I can have a camera person with... Moving around. Yeah. It doesn't, the, the camera doesn't have always to show your face, the interviewing person. Sometimes it's way more interesting to look out of the window, you know? Many would say it's always more interesting not to be on my face with <laughs> something else. But yeah, sure. exactly, yes. Sure. So if you have a like five-minute interview, it's not, it's not, it's boring sometimes if you look five minutes in the, in the face of the interview. So this is the, the thing and how you then distribute it later on. So. so you did this initially via, what was it, Indiegogo? Indiegogo campaign two years ago. Yeah, it was two years ago. So what so, took so long? It's hardware, and there's a reason why it's called hardware. So it's pretty hard. So we estimated <laughs> that it takes like two and a half years. It took four years. 
it costs like three times more. It's like there's a lot of tech going on. Mm. Putting together a sensitive capsule with a battery and Bluetooth is not the best idea you can have. I mean, we finally managed. It's working beautiful, but it took just a little bit longer than we thought. And now it's ready. Now it's ready. Uh, you can buy it online. And, well, the big news is that uh, soon you can take videos, which is like a quite cool thing. Because then you can record video. The missing part for video is the audio. Like, right. audio is, the smartphone camera audio is not good, especially if you're a little bit further away. So we can actually raise the bar for the value of the content creators make. And hopefully, later on, we also can distribute the content and help them to tap into new revenue models. So this is the kind of thing, you know, Amazon, Google, everyone wants to go into, like, more revenue models for bigger content production. Speaking of Amazon, Google, what is it about this time right now where we're seeing all of these connected cameras coming into the home, and I guess they're, they're pairing it with artificial intelligence, supposedly, to be... We've had broadband in the home for a while, oh, yeah. right? Th these cloud players have had tons of space in the cloud for a while. Why is this all happening now? I think, uh, so, you know, the last maybe five to ten years, it was all about photo, like, you know, Instagram stuff. Uh, so there are reports saying that in, in a couple of years, like, 80% of the internet traffic will be video. So a lot will be, like, professional video, with broadcasting videos, professional creators, but there will be also a lot of user-generated content. So, um, and where's all this traffic coming from? So video will be the next huge thing. So I think that's the, the, the business or the field they want to play in. Um, we actually want to play a little bit more on the creator side, which is, like, podcasters, video makers, broadcasters, journalists, musicians, everyone who has an audience behind them and want to like publish as good audio video quality as possible in a very short amount of time with efficient cost. What's the secret sauce behind this? Is it really on the software side and, and compression? Where did you have to do the most work? So it's, I think, a mixture of a lot of things. So I only developed, I only started this because the, the hardware, there was no hardware. We could, I actually wanted to build just an app, but there was no hardware, like no microphone, which gives you good quality and it works wirelessly integrated with your smartphones. There are solutions yet where you have like a handheld microphone with a receiver, with big gimbals, with the iPhone, but this is like more, it's hard to manage. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to set up. We wanted to have like this one button thing and two things. You have the cool camera already in your pocket, your smartphone. If you're a little bit further away from your videos, you need a, a, a wireless microphone. This is the reason why we're using like this lavalier microphone, lap clipper microphones. Yeah. Right? There's a reason why we have this. It's done in professional productions all the time. So why not offering this to more uh, a broader audience now? So tell me about who's seen it, what categories of people, specific people, uh, if you want, who are trying to produce professional quality content and uh, are, are interested in this product. So we built it for musicians in mind, but then figured out in the Go campaign that actually a third is speech applications, so podcaster journalists, mm -hmm. and a third are video makers. So they really love the product, and the other third is musicians, artists. But we're really surprised that we have talked to the biggest media companies. So the biggest media companies in the world came to us, actually, asking, oh, really, we wanted to do, like, smartphone videos, you know, broadcasting to hundreds of millions of people, but the only thing we're continuously talking about is audio. The audio is not good enough, right. so we still stick to cameras, um, and they want to like have more journalists to make more content, because that's what actually is important for media companies. And we're also talking to like 16-year-old artists who are buying the first phone and the first microphone ever, and they say, oh, maybe I save, I don't buy an iPhone next year. I just buy a microphone to get like better audio quality. And so it's the full range, which is quite nice. And for those who are just joining us, this is Mic Me. It is a microphone that will also use Bluetooth while it's capturing high quality audio to stream that audio to your phone. It'll even be able through the app to sync the video and the audio from this mic at the same time. So, you know, if you're doing podcasts or if you're trying to do some sort of a video project where you want the audio to be high quality but you don't want to keep the phone right by your face yes. the entire time, this allows you to solve for that. And I'm sitting here with uh, Philip Son, I'm going to mispronounce, Sonleitner. 
It's kind of, okay. almost sounds like Sound Lightner. Sound That's Lightner. I I, maybe I should change my name into Sound No, you should. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Philip Sound Lightner, co-founder and CEO of Mike Me. You've been working on this for a while, and it really fits Four in. Years. Four years. It really fits into a bigger trend. Deirdre Bosa from CNBC joins us now. Um, you've been covering... Amazon watching the entire space. Amazon just today announced uh, a connected camera solution that you know you can use it to watch your house, you can use it to watch outside your house, and actually let people into your house when you're not home. Deirdre. You can hear, look, we have this video that shows you how it works, but Essentially, this is a full system. The camera that was announced, the device this morning, is part of the system called Amazon Key. And, John, as you said, it lets people, like couriers, into your house to deliver a package. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about if you've ever had a package stolen off your front porch or front staircase. Um, but, you know, Amazon, as it always is, is thinking beyond that one step. Amazon, of course, is offering, partnering with local companies to offer more things like housekeeping or dog walkers. So this smart lock and smart system um, that works with the lock and the camera is designed to do just that, to erase some of the friction, right? And what, I love talking to you about this, John, because <laughs> I know you're a big skeptic. You don't have an echo in every room like I do. I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum yes, here. You are. Where yeah. I've already, <laughs> I've already let Amazon into my life, into my house. Um, that When they released this, I thought, you know, this is another way that they're going to make my life easier. I don't have to be home. I don't have to worry about a lot of these things. But I, I one of the questions I had was, what happens if you have a pet? One of the analysts I was talking to says he has two huge dogs and he doesn't trust that when a stranger enters his house with no, with, you know, mysterious access, yeah. he doesn't trust his dogs to attack him. And then you said on uh, Squawk Alley this morning, look at the gun culture here. And that did make me step back a little bit. Yeah. In the United States, uh, we, we have uh, an, an affinity for guns. Um, and, and every once in a while in local news reports, I read about, you know, somebody's kid was coming home at 2 a.m. and the parent thought they were already home and boom, uh, the, the, the kid gets shot. So I just I worry about the delivery people. Right. In these scenarios, yep. I can imagine the scenario. One person has this Amazon app and decides to let the delivery person in. Another person comes home and forgets. About it. It's a, so I just worry. I, I hope that that, you know, we as as people in our culture sort of catch up with the technology and people don't end up getting hurt. But I might surprise you, Deirdre. I actually have a couple connected cameras in my home. <laughs> now, they're pointed out the windows at the front in the back of the house, especially when right. I'm traveling. That means if anybody's coming up to the house, I can see who it was. You know, um, I, I happen to have the Logitech John, which variety, cameras? To hit Logitech. The Logitech variety. How, mu how much did that cost you? Uh, I think they were around a, a $150, uh, $150 range um, for, for okay. their cameras. So. So again, and then the Nest starts at about $200. Mm -hmm. The price point is very interesting for this home camera for Amazon, right? It's $120. That's, you know, $30 cheaper than the Logitech ones you have. If you buy them in a bundle, they're going to be even cheaper. Um, I, I spoke to Amazon's VP of devices earlier today, Charlie Trichler. I asked him, I said, are you guys making any money off of this camera? You know, <laughs> he said he couldn't, he couldn't talk about their financial model, but Amazon hasn't been shy in the past to say that they're not tr really trying to make a lot of money with these devices. What they're trying to do is get Amazon and Alexa into your house, into your everyday life so that you spend more. And anyone who's a Prime member uh, probably knows that very, very well, that they're good at that. So and this is one more way yeah, to spend more. You have to be a Prime subscriber to be able to use this camera. So they're, they're getting you first coming in the door. Like even if they're selling this thing at cost, if it helps them to sell Prime subscriptions, and then you can also buy more storage on the back end. If you want to hold the video, then you're paying, you know, 10 or 20 bucks a month or, right. you know, capped off at $200 a year, I think it is, if you pay annually. That, that's probably where the margin is. You know what, though? I would also be interested in Philip's opinion on this, too, right? Because when Amazon enters a space and they don't care about making money from something but simply getting a device into its users' hands, what if they turn to the microphone market? Is that really such a leap? Philip? Um, yeah, that, that's a common question, actually. But they are looking more on the completely consumer market, like, you know, everyday persons. You look, you look at your content, which is the video. Mm -hmm. We are looking more from... You're a creator, you have like 5,000, 50,000, 5 million fans behind you. 
So more on a little bit higher level, so one to a lot of people, not one to one. So I think Amazon is more like one to one. I want to show this video. I want to give you, you know, access to my grandmother to look into my house, stuff like that. Uh huh. So so this might be. I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. Like if Amazon's going to make something, they're going to make something that's a hundred bucks. They have to reach. Bucks, like they have to reach. Right. They have to reach. They have the, the, all the resources. Uh, but it's also nice to have, like, you know, Amazon in the part of the mix, like a competitor, because then you have some bigger companies being interested in good mic manufacturers. So. Right. Right. Not I mean, too bad. I guess the argument is, if people are making connected media products, right, right. and you're in the mix, then you get considered. I mean, I, I know I, I for one, I was, like, I was eager to talk to you today because Amazon's coming out with this product, and it's you know, it's in the same universe. Amazon okay. Prime, you know, they, they need to make videos. So, I have a question. I have another question for Philip. Okay, okay. Philip, if you don't think that Amazon may not, you know, it's not likely that they're going to create a microphone that may compete with you, but would you be willing? To hand over your sales data to Amazon, would you be willing to use, or do you already use FBA fulfillment by Amazon, or would you be willing to let their payment system in so that they had your sensitive data? So, uh, so we looked, we're already using them. So FBA is so fulfillment by Amazon. We already used them. We looked like in numerous um, different ways of how we logistically ship 2,000 products in 100 plus countries, and it was like. Amazon was the number one solution, so it's so easy. It, it's the best logistics solution for the U.S. So we uh -huh. shipped everyone in the U.S. Two, uh, a thousand pieces, roughly. We already started using their cloud backend because it's quite robust. It's quite easy to hop on it. Their cloud uh, backup? Uh, Abi, um, it's called the Amazon Cloud Service. You know, yeah. for for saving content, getting for saving this, right the audio, the audio logins and stuff like that in the yeah. future. Um, and we will sooner or later start selling in Amazon. Right now it's limited to dealers worldwide because we just get started. We are only a 10-man team, so quite a small company. But obviously nearly everyone has a login at Amazon, so Amazon Prime is, is a big thing for us yeah. for the next couple of months. So Phil, t talk to me about the startup process in this era where you've got so many online tools and resources to help you as an yeah. entrepreneur. You know, whether it's coding and being able to share code, whether it's having cloud resources to be able to back up you know, your files. Yeah. How different is it now getting something started than it might have been five, ten years ago? So I, so my background, I'm coming from AKT, which is one of the biggest microphone manufacturers, which is like a 200-man company owned by Harman, now owned, owned by Samsung. I quit my job four years ago. So we had like 200 people around me. I was product manager there mm. who helped with all the processes, all the workflows, logistics, development. So 200 people. So right? you were helping you know, make microphones for the big guys. For the big guys, right? Yeah. So now I'm, I started as a one-man show. So with those new tools, you're actually like crowdfunding, like all the online tools you mentioned, like mm -hmm. coding. You can get go fast, but the problem is you sometimes always, if you try a lot of different tools, you sometimes it's overwhelming because you, you try this thing, then you try this thing. <laughs> so you should uh, stay focused. But the cool thing is you can, with very limited resources, like we have now a 10 man team, woman team. In Austria. In Austria. Right. Uh, with very limited funding, um, you can go pretty far because this, this, we still have a product already who, which we can sell. Uh, after four years, which maybe sounds like a long time, but even Amazon and Apple, I mean, it's years in the making. For the consumer, it looks like, you know, Amazon just made a camera. I'm pretty sure they started like five years ago <laughs> yeah. doing that. I mean, it takes, them, it takes them 15 months when they already have a product usually to develop the next version, much less to develop the very first one. That's the very first one. There will be other hardware products. So it's the same for us. We already have some really good ideas about what we can make with this platform. So once you build like a robust platform and software piece, you just basically, it's like Lego, you put your things together and you can have completely new use cases. Um, that's actually what we see with, with Amazon, right? You know, all the, the Echo speakers, for example. Like, it took, I suppose, quite long to build the first one, but now it's like every six months you get a new device which looks different, behaves different, but it's mainly software in the background which behaves different. Deirdre, we've seen uh, holiday seasons that were supposed to be about connected speakers, about VR, about eBooks. How do you think this one is shaping up for connected media devices in general? Given that we're seeing uh, Google's clips uh, come out, we're seeing you know, GoPros got new cameras, and they're highlighting the connection right. to the phone as being a feature there. Um, and also, a Amazon, we were just talking about. I mean, is it possible that that's sort of a dark horse in the holiday season beyond all the connected speakers, these other connected media devices? 
I think so, because those connected speakers lead to more connected devices. That's how they get you, right? Um, and I'm aware that, you know, we work we work covering tech, and I don't know that people outside the coast are really buying um, Echoes and Google Homes or Apple. Remember, too, it's, it's HomePod is coming out as well. So, uh, but I, I think... I think it could be really interesting this year. And what's interesting, too, about Amazon is that Amazon doesn't just create all the products that work with Echoes. There are so many other companies from yeah. fridges to dishwashers to smart kettles. We were in the Alexa lab uh, talking to you last week, John, and you can just see how this home of the future looks. I don't know if it's going to take off in huge, huge scale this year, but I certainly think you're, you're going to see more products out there, and it'll be a theme for holiday seasons to come. Yeah, and here we are for those, again, who might have missed it. This is Mic Me. It's a connected microphone, $4.99, which at first made me raise both eyebrows price-wise, but it wirelessly streams high-quality audio to your phone. It'll sync it with video. Uh, really interesting product here with the co-founder and CEO, Philip Sonleitner. Uh, so thank you, Deirdre, uh, for, for joining us and adding that perspective. Philip, Thanks for having me. Speaking of sound, yep. this week on the Fort Knox podcast, different from the Fort Knox okay. live stream, but coming up this weekend, I sat down with Troy Carter, who a lot of people will know as uh, a creative chief over at Spotify. Um, he uh, has Adam Factory that he started. He used to uh, manage Lady Gaga, did some work with Megan Trainer, managing her and sort of relaunching her after All About That Bass to sort of let people know her full capabilities, managed, oh my goodness, um, John Legend and others. Anyway, sat down with him to talk about his career, his path, how he got into music. He came out, came up on the wrong side of Philadelphia, DJing house parties as a teenager and worked into the music industry. Uh, take a listen and a look at a little piece of what you'll get if you subscribe to Fort Knox over the weekend. Here he is. Talk to me about you. Uh, Philadelphia area native? Yes. Um, and... You worked with a lot of interesting artists over the years on your rise to management and uh, eventually um, venture capital, which I also want to talk to you about. What was your first interaction with the music business? I think my, my first interaction with the music business was, was, was buying um, 45s and albums from uh, Goodman's record store around the corner from my grandmother's house. <laughs> and, you know, just and doing house parties. And, um, and you DJing? I, I did everything from DJing to actually promoting house parties. You know, and I only was the DJ because it was, you would have to pay the DJ. So to save a little money, you know, um, I, I'd do the party myself. So, so I, I was a guy who fell in love with the, with music culture, mm -hmm. and then um, and so then how old were you? I, I started in the music business when I was about fourteen, about fourteen years old. Now you were allowed to promote and host house parties at like 14, 15 years old? Well, the, the truth is <laughs> it was a family that lived across the street from me that immigrated from Liberia. And, um, and their, their dad was a, a, a doctor at a hospital down the street, um, and he worked nights. <laughs> and he also had an illegal speakeasy in their basement <laughs> that when after nightclubs were over, uh, they would have this sort of these parties at their house. And a lot of the African community, they were, you know, they were from Liberia, so a lot of the African community in Philly would come to these parties, you know, after hours. So we cut a deal with my friend's dad that from 8 o'clock until midnight, we would do our little parties. Uh -huh. We would clean up and then get it ready for his parties that he would have. <laughs> and so we, would, that, we figured out a way to make some money, and that was like my first entrepreneurial uh, 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 business. How much and, did you make? You know, we would make a few hundred bucks a week. So for you know a, a yeah. fourteen-year-old kid that could <laughs> buy your own, you could buy your own sneakers, you could buy your own clothes. In the you early nineties, right? You, we did. You know, we did well. My, you know, and I didn't have to. Uh, you know, we didn't grow up with any mo you know, no money in my house, so I didn't have to put pressure on my mom. What's the first? either major artist or artist who was going to become major who you started interacting with around that time? You know, I, so 
I think Will Smith was the first, uh, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince were the first artists that I met, you know, and, you know, we had this idea that we were going to put a rap group together. If we met Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, they were going to give us a record deal. And I mean, in Philly, that was it. It was it. It's like I mean, you, get, you didn't get any bigger. And they, those were guys that were from our neighborhood that made it out the neighborhood. And, um, and we met those guys, and they did give us a record deal. How did you meet them? We just sta we, we stayed in front of their studio every single day until they showed up, pretty much. And, um, and, and they, they're still lifelong friends. And I, you know, I was on email with Jazzy Jeff yesterday about his new record and, um, you know, uh, on with Will last week about his son, Jay and Smith's new record. So we're still friends after all of these years. Is that just a Philly thing, or is that the way it used to work? Because, you know, check this out. One day back in Philly, four kids wanted to see me. <laughs> I mean, did you just, like, hang out in front of somebody's place and, and pitch? Phil Philadelphia is a small community. Um, you know, everybody, the music community all knows each other. So Boys the Men, uh, you know, all of us kind of came up together. Calling, yeah. yeah, we all came up together. And um, so I know those guys pretty well. And so the Roots, you know, Quest Love, his, his house was on the same house, same block as the church that I went to. Man. So, you know, all of us knew each other coming up. Yeah. Small world. Small, small world. city. Troy Carter, please do check out this episode. I promise you won't be disappointed. That's just a taste of Troy Carter, we get into the the you know business relationship with Lady Gaga and what he learned when that fell apart with Eve before Lady Gaga, which I had forgotten about. Megan Trainer, where the music business is headed, all of that stuff, and uh, sitting with me right here, the co-founder, CEO of the company that created this, Mike Me. I'll show you the side with the actual logo on it, yeah. Mike Me. Wireless microphone. I first raised my eyebrow at $4.99, but what it does, it streams its audio, high quality audio, to this. We'll even sync it to video. Um, you know, you have to go online uh, to, to give it a listen. Do a YouTube search, uh, do a Vimeo search. We'll put out some links on these channels as well. Definitely worth checking out. But uh, thank you, Philip Sonleitner. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, for What's joining me fun? here on Fort Knox once again. Troy Carter on the podcast that's coming up. This weekend, Rachel Carlson is the latest episode that you'll hear if you sign in right now to the Fort Knox podcast. She is the co-founder and CEO of Guild Education, a whole new way of uh, really helping the working class get a college education by engaging their companies and helping them to do it. Given all that we're talking about, about tax reform and inequality right now, she's got a really interesting take, really interesting entrepreneur, so I encourage you to do that. Once again, this has been John Fort for CNBC's Fort Knox here at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next.